Um, okay, so I'm going to follow the uh, note, sort of uh, the tone of the conference set by Michalis, which sort of for the most part will be an overview of the topic. But uh, what well, I thought about is giving more details, but there were quite a few talks that covered various notions uh, uh, before me by my Michalis, Hans, Spiros, and uh, maybe other people mentioned as well, some stuff. So I'll just, okay, keep it relatively simple. Um, so the main, the setting that also Yakov also mentioned earlier uh, is uh, uh, the Einstein equations coupled either in vacuum or coupled to a scalar field, in which case they, they take this form. So C is the scalar field, if you put it equal to zero, you get vacuum. And uh, the main unknown, which is uh, the, the, the space-time metric, the marble of this uh, system, like the Parthenon here in Endebra, uh, is, is lives over a D plus one uh, manifold. You can think of it as a time interval times some closed uh, D-dimensional manifold where D is larger or equal to three. And uh, this is what what sometimes called cosmological setting, just that the time slices is um, a closed uh, topology. Um, okay, and as we all very well know and heard in this uh, conference, this this system has an evolutionary part, which is hyperbolic or, or wave type, if you like. Um, and then there's initial data for this equation, which for the geometry. It's represented by the first and second fundamental form of this uh, um, sort of initial slice sigma as it sits inside the bigger ambient manifold. And uh, when we have a scalar field, we also have position and time derivative of the scalar field initially. And uh, these are not completely free. They have to satisfy certain constraint equations which are of elliptic type. We have the Hamiltonian constraint, momentum constraint. Uh, which uh, in this setting, they, they take this form. Um, and uh, as Michal has noted in, in, his, uh, in his talk, the beginning of the conference, uh, this, this is a well-posed uh, system, has a well-posed initial value problem. And moreover, there exists a unique, nice, small, globally hyperbolic development. Uh, so everything is very nice. And okay, the point is to study this, uh, this uh, maximal solution, uh, all right, but not in general, like we will study it in, in specific regimes close to some uh, fixed solutions. Um, okay, so the protagonists of this, of this uh, uh, presentation were already mentioned by Spiros and, and Hans. So these are the Kastner solutions. Um, so if you like, we take for simplicity, simplicity uh, uh, the, um, Spatial topology being the torus, the dimensional torus, and uh, the, then the metric takes uh, this very simple form. It, it's homogeneous. There's only time dependence. These PIs are the Kastner exponents that we've heard in Hans's talk and and Spears's. And uh, whenever there's a scalar field, it's a multiple of the logarithm, which is also B is a constant. Okay, and these have to satisfy um, these constraints, algebraic restrictions. To have in order to have a solution to the Einstein equations. Um, and moreover, okay, and the, the main feature that is interesting for this presentation is the uh, so-called Big Bang singularity as one goes to the past, uh, um, let time go to zero. And this is like a crashing singularity in the sense of uh, that Hans, is, uh, mentioned, Hans mentioned yesterday, uh, the volume of the time slices goes to zero. And the curvature invariants blow up. So uh, yeah, that's that's an essential singularity. <laughs> okay. And uh, the main question that uh, pe people would like to address in, in this uh, is whether this uh, this type of phenomena is is general, like it's it's general solutions exhibit this type of uh, breakdown, or is this due to symmetries and and when you perturb uh, it will go away. All right, so for that, uh, okay, we need to look at perturbations. 
And again, Hans mentioned yesterday that uh, uh, we have Hawkins theorem. Okay, so um, there's a very general result due to Hawking that goes back to the 60s, uh, which says that if the past mean curvature is negative, so let me also draw a picture. Then um, in the past, you have to uh, be incomplete. So if we imagine that sigma is somewhere here, let's say equals one, okay? Then there is the global, the maximal globally hyperbolic development as, as Michael has mentioned, okay? Both to the future and the past. Now, uh, we don't want to look at the future because we all know that the future is bad, right? There's <laughs> <laughs> nothing good coming out of the future. <laughs> in fact, that would explain the difference in our votes. <laughs> <laughs> and in fact, I also think that people in Scotland are, are, will agree with me that the past was much better. So <laughs> <laughs> we only look at the past. Nostalgic of the past. So that's why we went to the Springsteen's concert. <laughs> uh, okay, so here there is a moment where, where there was no Brexit. <laughs> and in general, as we go to the past, uh, well, things are much better. You know, mankind, etc. <laughs> But as all good things, uh, Hawking's theorem tells us that even the past has to end. <laughs> there is in the past, let's say if you shoot time like geodesics to the past, in final proper time, you're gonna hit some boundary okay. of your maximal globally, well, maximum solution. Okay, and this is in particular valid for, uh, uh, for perturbations of um, the explicit Kastner solutions. So since the volume is shrinking, that's the mean curvature is first variation of area. So it will um, uh, be negative and therefore we have this past boundary. Okay, and the main question, the natural question is whether this, ba this boundary is singular. So is this breakdown, this incompleteness associated uh, to a singularity formation and uh, I don't need to explain what strong cosmic censorship is. So we heard by Michalis. So according to this conjecture, generically, this should be so, okay? And this generic term, uh, generic, the word generic is essential because uh, we have some examples where things are smooth and extendable, and therefore you have non-uniqueness or failure of determinism after the boundary. Um, Okay, but this, the expectation is, the hope is that these are unstable and then generically you should have a, a space like boundary, which is, uh, no, a boundary, which is singular. And then the other question, once once you sort of uh, accept this, uh, is whether, uh, what's the character of the, uh, of the boundary? So it can either be space-like or null or a combination of the two. Um, so as we saw, in, uh, in Michalis's talk, uh, in black hole interior, there is the uh, great result by Michalis and Jonathan, uh, which says that at least near time like infinity, there should be a piece of the singularity of the boundary, which is which is not. So in this set, uh, however, in, in our situation, in the cosmological setting where we have uh, Hawking's theorem, uh, the expectation is that generically, at least, it will be space-like. Um, all right, and then after we sort of have accepted that this is what we're expect, what we'd like to see, what we're expecting. Uh, the next question is how does the solution behave uh, as you approach the space-like singularity? And there, are, at the moment, two rivaling scenarios, uh, and. Uh, we heard in Hans's and Spurs's talk as well, that either things will be like uh, Kastner in certain sense, Kastner type, uh, and this is what's called the Sapkuriko regime in some papers in the physics literature, or if you like, it's the triangle 
from the shaded triangle from Hans's uh, talk inside that circle. And in particular, uh, Kastner singularities in that regime should be stable in a certain sense. Okay, and then that's, that's the result that hopefully we'll get to toward the end with Igor and Jared. Um, okay, and the other scenario proposed uh, more than 50 years ago by three, phys three Russian physicists, uh, Belinsky, Kalatnikov, and Lifshitz, uh, is uh, that uh, something, well, outside the subcritical regime, generically, something much more violent, much more uh, complicated will, uh, will take place. And uh, okay, again, we heard that in Hans's talk, so I don't need to say much about this. Uh, maybe we'll have time to, to say a couple of comments, but there will be oscillations of this cosmic parameters as you go to the singularity in a certain sense. Okay. So that's, that's a general picture. And uh, now let's move on to uh, some heuristics that come from this, uh, this sort of physics papers in uh, sort of uh, many years ago um, and see what we can get. So the, what I call, what I said by Kastner type here, I mean, something like the metrics that, that we saw in Hans's and Spirit's talk, where uh, the, the leading order behavior looks like Kastner, although the Kastner exponents and the principal one forms are not really uh, constant, but uh, they, they depend, they change, they vary uh, depending on, the, on which spatial point you are on the, on the singular hypersurface. Okay. Um, the singularity is synchronized uh, t equals zero by assumption. So we already assume it's space-like and that it is on t equals zero. And uh, okay, the, uh, the degrees of freedom that you have in this expression, are the PIs that have satisfy this, this algebraic relations. And, and we also have a B of X whenever there is a scalar field um, and the coefficients of this principal one, which also depend on X. Uh, so you can think of this as being your asymptotic data. Okay. And now, and now uh, we want to plug this into the Einstein equations and check for consistency. Okay. So this is, if you like an ansatz of what the singularity should be, uh, could be, and we want to check uh, if it's if it's uh, if it agrees with the Einstein equations. So you can, for example, you can take um, a, a frame which is adapted to these uh, uh, principal one forms, and compute the components of the second fundamental form. These blow up like one of a T, and the coefficient is related to the Kastner exponents. And because of the Kastner exponents sum into one, as we also saw yesterday. Uh, the mean curvature is exactly leading order minus one over T. Okay, and now we have to plug this into the Einstein equations to see if we have the same, uh, sort of, if we cover this type of behavior. And basically the Einstein equations are, are, or at least part of these, uh, if, if we remove the constraints uh, are these. So the evolutionary part. Okay, this is something like the ADM equation if you like, in this in this uh, heuristic analysis, and uh, little so unbold faced G here is the induced metric on the on the spatial slices, the time slices, which is Riemannian, and uh, bold faced G's are space time metric. Okay, so if for example we're in vacuum, this is zero. Okay, so you get an evolution equation for K. Of course, this has to be coupled to little G, right? But for the moment, we assume G is known by the ansatz. And we just want to check whether K has this behavior uh, that we computed using the ansatz. Okay. Um, so if we are if we have a scalar field, this will be a product of derivatives of the scalar field. Okay. And um, as you see, if this was zero, right, then just just by integrating this, you confirm the leading order be the behavior computed by the ansatz, right? So uh, what we would like to have in order to confirm to, to for in order for the answers to be consistent with the Einstein equations, we would just like to have to, to show that to say that this right hand side is low order in T. So if it's less singular uh, than uh, some power T to the minus two, then, then everything checks out. Okay, so this is what I just said. So if this is true, 
then we're fine. Uh, it's consistent. And uh, okay, now you compute this instead of uh, looking at evolution equations, you just compute this using the answers. Okay, and you see that in general, uh, this contains powers uh, that to the minus two times certain expressions, algebraic expressions in the Gasser exponents, uh, which all, all of these are possible in general, uh, where i, j, b are distinct. Okay, so these are the most dangerous terms. And um, if these are, you know, these combinations are strictly less than one, then, then this, this condition, which is equivalent to being the subcritical regime, sort of what, this is sort of exactly, I think it's very similar to what Hans wrote yesterday about L1, LN, LN minus one. Um, okay. All right, and this is what we mean by being in the subcritical regime or, or in the shaded triangle. Um, all right, and in this regime, whenever this is satisfied, the heuristic analysis, oops, shouldn't press it for too long of uh of uh, uh that, that we just did of our assets is is okay with the Einstein equations all right so in particular what is the subcritical regime what does it contain so if you look at the scala field then this is a legitimate condition in the case where all custom exponents are positive okay so because we sum up to one for example if you take v equals three and you can see that uh Trivially, these are these are strictly less than one. Uh, however, in vacuum, uh, it's actually not 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 the case. At least not in low spatial dimensions. So, if you just take the vacuum case, you see that one Kastner exponent is exactly negative, and two are positive. So, what what Spears was calling one expanding, two shrinking directions uh, in his talk. And if you just take this precise combination you see where P1 is negative, you see that this is larger than one. So this invalidates the, the answers. So it's not consistent with the answers. Okay. Uh, however, when you increase, so this is a nice observation by De Mareno and Spindle. Um, when you increase the uh, number of spatial dimensions, it's easy to relatively easy to see that if you increase them a lot, then the Kastner exponents can be smaller and smaller which would mean that this combination is less than one. And actually, so it's uh, interesting that the, for all dimensions, spatial dimensions strictly less than 10, this condition cannot be satisfied. So you're not, you cannot be in the subcritical regime, but for dimensions larger or equal to 10 or space-time dimensions larger or equal to 11, uh, this is possible. So 11 seems to be the magic number here. Um, okay, and moreover, so going back to the three spatial dimensions, uh, BKL observed that uh, this estimate, which is consistent with the sort of the subcriticality condition and, and having uh, you know, the answer has been consistent with the Einstein equations, is true if this coefficient, if this, if this uh, term omega one wedge d omega one is equal to zero. So this is the coefficient of the bad power of t that was invalidating the heuristic argument, okay? And this, this is actually in the integrability condition. This tells you that, that uh, the one direction that corresponds to the negative Kastner exponent has to satisfy some polarization condition. Okay, but you know, in general, there's no reason for this to be true. This eliminate this imposes a restriction on this coefficient, so it eliminates one degree of freedom, if you like. Um, and therefore, they concluded that Kastner type singularities, in at least in one plus three vacuum, should be non-generic. Okay. In fact, in the first paper, they said therefore singularities are non-generic. But of course, this, this need not be true because you could have other type of singularities, right? It just says that this type of singularities are non-generic. Okay. Um, oh, I should mention for people who like fluids that uh, yeah. in the subcritical regime, uh, you could also have a stiff fluid. So P equals rho is still, it sort of resembles a lot the scalar field, for example, if you're in rotation. Um, but in general, like P equals rho is also in the subcritical regime. 
All right. Um, okay. All right. But then they revisited. So we're still in the heuristics of BKL. So they revisited the, their work, their earlier work, and uh, try to figure out what is the more complicated singularity that will occur. Okay. And they did the following sort of, okay, try to present roughly their argument. Um, so, okay, there is a term on the right-hand side, which, which is more singular. So this is in one plus three vacuum only, uh, which is more singular than, than you can handle. So this is not gonna be cast like forever. Okay. Uh, so in particular, even when you are close to a homogeneous, let's say Kastner solution, where this will have a very small coefficient, when T gets very small, it will, this term will dominate. So you can try to guess which terms are important and which are not, and you throw away the terms which are unimportant, and then you get an integrable equation. And it turns out that this equation initially was modeled by one constant type solution, but as t goes to zero is modeled by a different constant type solution. And the exponents change in this fashion. So the, the new exponents are rational functions of previous ones. Um, there is a change between the negative Kastner exponent, which becomes positive, and the smaller uh, positive Kastner exponent, which becomes negative. And uh, okay, this is sort of analogous to this line and triangle and circle in Haas's talk. So somehow the bounce from one uh, point to another. Um, but this doesn't mean that this will, you know, this this new Kastner solution models. The, the solution all the way, the, act, the original solution all the way to t equals zero, because now there is another sort of, the, the, the P2 prime is negative. So terms which you threw away in your original argument are now important. So you reintroduce them and some other terms are unimportant and you play the same game again, you get a different, uh, uh, different equation, which is again integrable and it gives you uh, sort of another transformation of the of the cast and exponents. Okay, and by this type of argument, they concluded that there should be an infinite uh, change in the Kastner exponents, or at least the solution should be modeled, let's say, as you go to t equals zero in different time intervals by different Kastner by different Kastner parameters. Uh, and this oscillation should be infinite. And by, by this, this type of formula, you can also conclude that the change is chaotic. Okay. And I guess this is uh, similar things to, to what, uh, what Hans mentioned in his talk. Um, okay. So these are heuristics. Let's jump now to uh, what is known. Um, so as far as the oscillations are concerned, the only theorems that exist are in the homogeneous setting where you only have ODs, okay? But you don't play this game by throwing terms on and off, like uh, uh, sort of you look at the, the whole OD system and you try to infer, you try to prove something. Okay, and uh, I think if I'm not mistaken, the first result is by you, Hans, uh, in, in that direction. Uh, the first result by Marsha Weber. Oh, really? Sorry about that. Okay. Um, okay. So th there are a few uh, theorems. As far as I understand, uh, the uh, uh, the sort of the most, let's say, um, detailed result is by uh, uh, the French French group, uh, French team Begin and Butiel, uh, where they show that for a positive measure in some sense of, of conditions, of initial conditions, you have this type of chaotic behavior. If, if okay, I'm not uh, misinterpreting. Um, all right, then uh, as we heard in Francis talk yesterday, there are a lot of numerics. Uh, I'm sorry for not, um, this I know even less, so I didn't, uh, okay. I'm not uh, perhaps the person to comment on these, but, uh, in general, as we saw in the videos, very nice videos by Franz. Franz here? Oh, over there. Okay. Um, so everything seems to be uh, in accordance with the heuristics, apart from some points which look a bit spiky. 
okay? And uh, these were not predicted in the original analysis by BKL. Uh, all right, and, and it remains to be seen, I guess, uh, if there's anything else. Um, okay, and, and uh, at least in, in the one particular symmetry class, Gaudi symmetry, uh, uh, things have been like almost generic solutions have been completely understood. And um, this is a symmetry with, uh, so this is a one plus one problem. And there's, there's a, a certain integrability condition. Uh, you have two killing fields with, uh, which are surface orthogonal. Um, okay, and uh, um, generically we have this custom type behavior apart from uh, finitely many points, which there could be spikes, but we don't know whether there are actually or not. Well, generically, I mean, there are solutions with spikes and that's also a statement. Okay, okay, this is a statement yeah, that yeah. There is, okay, there is a kind of construction by, by generation, a method of generating, let's say, solutions with spikes by Randall and Weaver in Gaudi symmetry. Okay, and these are, correspond to certain discontinuity in the asymptotic data, if you like, the custom exponents. Okay, and then there are more general spikes in U1 symmetry, not just Gaudi. So there's one, only one transition symmetry um, in a sort of, also a proposition for mixing the oscillation, how, how the oscillations with the spikes sort of uh, mix together in the whole conjectural picture. Okay. Um, all right. And then the other uh, sort of type of results that exist are constructions. So here you prescribe the way we did it in the heuristic analysis, you prescribe the custom type singularity but then you want to solve for a, a remainder to make it a legitimate actual solution. Of course, this doesn't tell you much about the dynamics, but at least it gives you examples. Okay, and there's been many constructions uh, of Kasten type singularities. Uh, then we have stability of Kasten singularities in the sense that you go to t equals one, you perturb the Kasten data and you look at the past development of this data and you want to uh, prove that the singularity forms and it is of caster types in some sense. Okay, so that's what I call by stability. So this really uh, gives you an understanding of the dynamics in the regime where you're close to a background uh, solution, for example, homogeneous solution. Okay, and then there are uh, results in the in sort of what I call here conditions for constant type behavior or custom like uh, that we heard also yesterday by from Hans where you assume that certain things are bounded you have some scale invariant bounds that you expect to be true in most cases most examples and then from that you want to derive the the rest you want to show you want to understand completely the behavior of the solution okay um, all right, so in the remaining of the of the time, uh, I would like to talk about the uh, the stability problem. So as I just mentioned, we have perturbations of Kastner data on Sigma one. We are, of course, in order to have Kastner type, you have to be in this, to prove some kind of stability, you have to be in this subcritical regime, right? The shaded angle from Hans's talk. So this, this uh, condition has to be satisfied by the background uh, solution. And then, okay, you want to prove that the singularity forms and it is of constant type. And okay, stability will only hold in a renormalized sense, in the sense that the asymptotic data of your solution should be close uh, to the background asymptotic data in certain sense. Okay. All right, and there's this uh, it's completely different from the heuristic analysis in various ways. One reason is that uh, we don't know where the singularity lies. So the, in the heuristic analysis or in the constructions, you just put it on t equals zero by hand. Here you don't know because you start from t equals one, so you have to locate it somehow. Okay, that's one. And then, okay, there's other type of things that also appear in many other works, like degenerate estimates due to, due to the singularity, perhaps loss of derivatives, etc. So, 
Uh, okay. So the framework is that we use uh, is um, somehow relate. I mean, it sort of it looks a little bit similar to the the framework uh, that we introduced in the heuristic analysis. Although now we don't have proper time, we allow some laps of for the foliation. We haven't really fixed it yet. Uh, we have an orthonormal frame which is adapted to the foliation, but uh, it doesn't correspond to the principle, uh, the, the 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 frame which is adapted to the principal directions of of your final custom type singularity, because you don't really know yet that you have a custom type singularity. So again, it's a problem like uh, which which directions to have, okay? And we propagate it in a way such that this is adapted, all right? And the main unknowns for this problem are the connect, the Ricci coefficients or the, uh, for the, or the connection coefficients for this frame, which is the components of the second fundamental form and um, spatial connection coefficients that we use to expand the spatial Ricci curvature on the right-hand side, which was the, uh, um, crucial for the estimating it was crucial for the consistency of the, uh, cast type behavior with the Einstein equations. Okay, all right. So step one would be to uh, uh, fix now the foliation. So it turns out, um, as it was mentioned, perhaps hinted by by Hans and and Spiros, that there is a convenient uh, foliation you can consider for this type of problems. It seems that they really like the constant mean curvature slicing. So even when you don't have constant mean curvature slicing, uh, as, as Spiros talked about, it somehow turns out to be to lead in order CMC in the sense that the mean curvature, the first order term uh, in T doesn't, doesn't depend on the spatial variables. So might as well uh, consider that from the beginning. And the hope is that um, this will synchronize the singularity at equals zero. So of course, for the background, this is exactly true. Okay, so you can expect that for the perturbation, you can also uh, have it. Okay, and um, uh, re the reason that intuitively, at least, that this could perhaps synchronize the singularity, uh, one of the reasons is that this leads to an elliptic uh, equation for the lapse of the foliation. So here I'm using Einstein summation for repeated indices. So this looks kind of like little plasian, okay? And therefore, uh, okay, we have an infinite speed of propagation gauge, which could potentially, of course, this has to be proven, uh, synchronize the singularity at equal zero. The problem is that if you have, um, as Hans mentioned in Spiros yesterday, uh, uh, if you have a hyperbolic gauge like proper time and you initialize in, in away from the singularity, Okay, then different points in the singularity will not communicate as you go close enough. So if the geometry is different here, there's no reason why this distance would be the same, right? So in, in principle, if, if you have proper time, uh, this could be, the singularity could be something graph, right? Which is, let's say close to zero. So, so in, in sort of general gauges, this would happen. However, in this elliptic in the elliptic gauge, it turns out that we have a free uh, sort of a synchronization of the gauge for free. This means that we don't need to change the foliation uh, for the rest of the problem. Okay, and it's actually also makes it nice to estimate the laps. There is this uh, very singular term on the right hand side, which has a good sign. So this basically kills everything. And okay, I mean I'm not saying it's trivial, but you can estimate the laps, assuming the other variables satisfy the estimates that you want, you can estimate the laps from this. Um, the wave equation, again, uh, by using this gauge, you have certain uh, certain form for the wave equation, which you can use, uh, provided the other variables are controlled to, to get energy estimates for this, which are sort of consistent with what you would like to see. Um, so then it remains, okay, you also have an, an OD for the frame, but then it remains really, you have, you get a first order. So the main equations you need to concern yourself with 
are the uh, first order PDE system for K and gamma. So these components, this is sort of like a part of the spatial Ricci curvature here, <laughs> derivatives of the, connect, the spatial connection coefficients. And here you also have first derivatives of K, spatial derivatives. So it's, this is really a system. Uh, so this is a first order system. If you ignore N, let's say N, we've estimated. Uh, it, it's actually not symmetric, but this, this is a classical, this is a usual problem with this type of ADM systems and you can fix it by using the constraints. So if you use all, all sort of the, the structure of the Einstein equations, you can have estimates for energy estimates for these two variables in general like for the system. Okay. Um, all right, so this is what I said. So in, if you use the constraints, you can sort of get energy identity for the system. Okay, but then when, since the system is nonlinear, you need to commute with derivatives, et cetera. And as you try to do uh, a sort of a top order energy estimate, you see that there are a lot of terms which have this form. This is like a top order term times a coefficient that depends on the second fundamental form, uh, which we said is like one over T times a coefficient that depends on the Kastner exponents, right? So, okay, once you do energy estimates for a couple PDE, things will add up. So you will get some, uh, some constant C star uh, of, of, this, of this type of terms, which we call borderline because they're sort of borderline non-integrable. So this, this, when you apply ground wall, instead of getting an estimate uh, sort of bounded energy, you get that the energy cannot blow up faster than some polynomial power. Okay, and this, uh, this is star, you can try to look for cancellations, but it's not very clear for anisotropic, uh, very anisotropic background casting exponents that this is star will be small. Actually, in the first work, first stability works by, by Igor and Jared, they actually showed that this is epsilon. So you lose only very little uh, at the top order. Okay. But in general, since that kind of cancellations might not be there, uh, you have to find a way to deal with it. And therefore you're forced to, to have a bootstrap type of argument, which is consistent with this. It allows for very bad top order energies, but at the L infinity, at least you recover uh, this, this near optimal control. So you know that K is like one of a T, you know that the spatial rigid curvature is less singular than T to the minus two, and therefore you have this caster type behavior, at least at the low orders. And then you have very, very bad control at the top order, which you don't really know whether this is actually there. It's just that you have weak control. Okay, and uh, <clears throat> in such a scheme, you estimate intermediate derivatives by, by interpolating. And all right, in order to guarantee that at least at the low orders, you're gonna have very good control, uh, you need to be borrowing a very small power of this, of this guy. Uh, when you interpolate. So that's why we need to take many derivatives. And the good thing is that this C star only depends on the background Kastner exponents. So you can take n as large as you want, the C star will remain the same. And okay, this gives you hope that you can uh, close the system, provided you can get this, uh, well, you can estimate the L infinity norms in a sort of optimal way. All right, so let's see how that works. Um, to get a taste, for example, if you look at the OD for the frame coefficients, you assume that you have bounds for the right-hand side, okay? And this gives you uh, a power for the behavior for, for, for the frame coefficients, which is less singular than t to the minus one because pi is less than one, okay? So that's, that's easy. Uh, if you try to do the same thing for k, from the OD, you get one over t, which is exactly the behavior you want to see. And the right hand side is fine, provided uh, gamma and, and, and the frame coefficients are less singular than t to the minus one. Actually, you also need one partial derivative of gamma to be less singular than t to the minus one. Okay, if you have that, you integrate. This term is low order, so indeed t times k is bounded. All right. Um, so you need. So the, what you need is this, this type of spatial variables to be less singular than the, than the second fundamental form. This sort of corresponds to the AVTD behavior that Spiros talked about in his, in, in his talk. 
that time derivatives are, are worse than, than spatial derivatives in a sense. Uh, okay, all right. And uh, as, as, as I already mentioned, so if you know this, uh, you treat this term, for example, as EI times partial gamma, and the partial gamma you interpolate, you take too many derivatives, so that you only see like a very small power of the bad top order estimate, and therefore you guarantee that this is also the singularity of the minus one, and this sort of checks out. Okay, so then the only remaining variable that you need to check is the L infinity of this guy, this partial connection coefficients. Um, uh, however, there's no uh, diagonal OD form for, for this for this variable as, as the previous ones. So it's uh, at first glance, um, not, not so straightforward to estimate. And the crucial observation here is that if you look at a certain combination of these that really corresponds to the structure coefficients that we barely saw at Hans's talk, but it was sort of in the last slides. Um, okay, and these do satisfy a diagonal, they have a diagonal OD um, uh, structure. The, double, the ones with the double indices, so this, this, this sort of uh, transformation, this is sort of like a one-to-one, -one, right? So you know, to estimate the gammas, it's office to estimate the, the structure coefficients. And for the ones with double indices, you're back in the case of, of the frame coefficients. So this is easy to estimate. And all right, so the, the ones which are trouble, could be trouble, are the ones with distinct indices. And then you see that exactly for this ones, the, uh, the combinations in the uh, subcritical condition appear. So these are the, uh, the variables that could potentially um, sort of invalidate this whole argument. But we have assumed that these, the background values are less than one. So therefore you get that this, this also is less singular than two to the minus one. All right. Uh, and this is actually the only place where we used the subcriticality condition. So this whole scheme um, sort of, it, we only require it to bound the structural coefficients, which is these indices, for which, you know, these type of combinations could be potentially larger than one if you're outside of the unstable regime, uh, the subcritical, subcritical regime. So in this sense, it sort of identifies, this analysis identifies the bad variables in uh, you know in the sort of unstable regime. Okay. Um, all right. And by uh, in this fashion, we prove the following result. Um, given a, a sort of explicit Kasser solution in the subcritical regime, which is non-empty for the spatial dimension large equal to three for the scalar field or Higher, di higher spatial dimensions than uh, large or equal to 10 uh, in, in vacuum. Um, solutions that arise from sufficiently small perturbations in, in high order, <laughs> you need a lot of derivatives, high order solvable spaces, uh, satisfy the following estimates. You have that T times K is, is close to the background value. Okay, the same thing about the time derivative of the scalar field. You have that the um, spatial energy curvature, which was important to be less singular than t to the minus two in order to have this consistency uh, <clears throat> with custom time behavior and the isolated equations is indeed true. And this is all relative to constant mean curvature foliation where t goes all the way to zero. Okay, so that, Sort of okay, and you could have similar bounds if you like for, let's say, finitely many spatial derivatives, provided n is much larger than this number. Okay, um, okay, and as a sort of direct consequence of this uh, of these bounds, uh, you can prove that t times k and t times the time derivative are not just bounded; uh, they have a limit. And the eigenvalues of this limit for t times k gives you the Kastner exponents, the final Kastner exponents. And the, uh, the limit of this guy gives you the final uh, linear order coefficient of the scalar field. 
All right. And from the constraint equations, which are always valid, you can also get this fact by passing to the renormalizing and passing to the limit. You also uh, get that the Kretschmann scalar really blows up. So this is a positive function on the final Kastner exponents. Uh, and this means in particular that this, your space time is passed in extendable as in the system sense. Uh, you get it for free by the blob of the curvature. Okay. And uh, uh, one comment about the, uh, <clears throat> the unstable regime. So as we heard in, in Spiros's talk, if you have a polarized condition, uh, you you get well a proper polarized condition. You get um, uh, constant type behavior, and uh, we also see that in uh, in our analysis. So if you assume you have a Keeling field which is hyperorthogonal, or if you like uh, a translation symmetry in X three and your metric having this form, uh, then um, this you, you consider a frame which is adapted to the killing direction. And then you get for free that these structural coefficients with distinct indices are in fact all zero. So the only, the one you would like to be zero is the one that corresponds that has OD branch more singular than the digital minus one. So this guy, but okay, all of them are zero anyway. And therefore you don't see them in the analysis. You can repeat the same estimates and there's no danger or there's no instability. Okay. Um, all right. And maybe let, let's end with some relevant questions and then you can ask your questions if you want. Um, <laughs> all right. So one, I guess I have to ask this uh, uh, also for Hans is that the, in what we prove, and this is actually very nice um, that perhaps uh, relates a little bit to Francis talk uh, is that we don't really need to have a precise control over the spatial variables. We just want them not to be too singular. And throughout the bootstrap argument, we don't have any kind of refined behavior uh, for the spatial geometry. So you cannot, we cannot really recover, at least not immediately, um, this nice form of the metric that we saw in the heuristic argument. So this thing. Okay, we get the Kastner exponents, but not the, uh, the spatial geometry. So this is on one hand, you could say, okay, I would like to understand more. But then on the other hand, I think it's very nice because I haven't seen, uh, so in many, many works, people really work with frames which are sort of adapted to the, to the principal directions and, and sort of control everything in a near optimal way. So here we can afford to not care about these terms. You, you do care about K, so K has to be like one of the T, you cannot lose there, anything. Um, okay, uh, why did I ask that? Yeah, okay, so now you can say, all right, given this result, can you change your frame and, and get something better for the um, uh, spatial geometry? Okay. And, and what Hans presented yesterday could, might be useful, all right. Then I also have to ask about C0 and extendability in the presence of Jan. Um, we don't know, of course. Um, okay, and um, uh, one interesting question is whether these degenerate top order estimates are actually there or is just, uh, we just do, or is it like the, the crudeness of our method of energy estimates? Uh, okay, this, this is, somehow interesting because it's related to the regularity of the asymptotic data. So these Kastner exponents, right, are as regular as the limit, well, actually, as the eigenvalues of the limit of T times K, okay? Um, so if T times K cannot be controlled or blows up at high orders, of course, you have no sense of, of identifying Kastner exponents. So if you really want, uh, the, to study the regularity of the asymptotic data or have some sort of scattering map from asymptotic data to initial data on T equals one, you need to understand better this issue. Um, and uh, the, the final thing that I would like to mention has to do with uh, the unstable regime. So for example, one plus three vacuum, 
you can try to identify uh, the stable submanifold in, in, the, in this direction from t equals one to t equals zero by modulating out the, the instabilities. So by, if you eliminate this variable, which is dangerous, you could hope to prove some kind of, uh, you know, teleological stability in Michalis's uh, uh, terms. Um, okay. Um, but it is infinite code dimension. Yeah, it's infinite code dimension. But the, the, the problem would be to capture exactly the largest class. So this this has been constructed recently by, by so we have constructed with Jonathan something that could potentially be the entire class, but it would be nice to also go the other way around from T plus one. Okay, that's that's all I wanted to say. Thank you very much for the attention.